All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Zephaniah chapter 1, Coming Judgment and the Reasons for It. We'll get into the first verse, Zephaniah, the man and his times. Verse 1, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So the first verse of the prophecy of Zephaniah sets it apart from most other prophets and that it told us uh, both his time and his lineage. Zephaniah was an unusual prophet in that he was of a royal lineage descending from the godly king Hezekiah. And the name Zephaniah means Yahweh hides or Yahweh has hidden. And Zephaniah was almost certainly born during the long wicked reign of Manasseh, whose reign began 55 years before the start of Josiah's reign. And so Zephaniah was probably hidden for his own protection. And so Josiah was a godly young king who brought great revival and reform to Judah. But Josiah reigned for 10 years before he led his great revival. Zephaniah was likely written in the years before the revival. And God used this prophecy to bring in further revival. And so since Zephaniah predicts the destruction of Nineveh, which happened in 612 BC, we know that his prophecy belongs to the first part of the reign of King Josiah. And so the 12 minor prophets are divided into two groups, pre-exile and post-exile. The first nine are pre-exile, writing before the Babylonians conquered and exiled Judah. The last three are post-exile, writing during and after the return of Israel from Babylon to the Promised Land. Zephaniah is the last of the pre-exile prophets and can be said to sum up the messages of the previous eight. This is why Zephaniah seems unoriginal to some scholars, because he quotes the words and ideas of many of the other previous prophets. All right, verse 2 and 3, the promise of judgment. Verse 2, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of land, says the Lord. So Zephaniah didn't waste any time getting to the point. Uh, delivering the message of the Lord, he warned of a harsh and complete judgment that was going to consume everything before the Lord. All right, verse 4 through 6, judgment is promised to idolaters. Verse 4, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from his place. The names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priest. Those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops. Those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord but all, who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So the promise of judgment in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 was broad enough to include the whole planet uh, and to allow some to think that God didn't really mean them. Now God's going to focus in on his people in the land of Judah and he would not allow them to think that he just spoke just of others. And King Josiah inherited a corrupt nation from his father, Ammon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, a nation that was almost given over to idolatry uh, completely in 2 Kings 21. Here, God announced judgment against the idol worshippers in Israel. Apparently, both the leadership and the people heeded this announcement of judgment because in the, kings of, uh, in the days of Josiah, this kind of gross idolatry was put away in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 4 through 15. All right, verse 7 through 9, judgment is promised to royalty. Verse 7, be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has invited his guest. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children. And all such are as clothed with foreign apparel. In the, day, in the same day I will also punish all those who leap over the, house, the threshold who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. So God addresses the royalty of Judah in a way that they're not used to hearing. He tells them to shut up and listen to his pronouncement of judgment. A sacrifice of judgment was made against a wicked nation. And so this warning came to a godly king during a time of reform. God warns Josiah and the whole royal community what's going to happen if they don't follow through on their turning to God. And the priests and leaders of Judah were ashamed of their national identity, so they loved to dress in foreign apparel. They wanted to be as much like the worldly nations around them as they could possibly be. 
And so this probably refers to the uh, those who leap over the threshold. It's going to refer to bringing pagan customs and superstitions into the house of God in the same way that the worshipers of Dagon honored silly and offensive superstitions in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 5, which states, Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. All right, verse 10, 11, judgment is promised to merchants. Verse 10, and there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all those who handle money are cut off. So merchants and those with money trusted in their riches, now God's going to promise to cut down those steeped in that kind of idolatry. Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 shows us that this is not just an Old Testament concept where it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. All right, verse 12 and 13, judgments promised to the complacent. Verse 12, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Therefore their good shall become booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. So no one's going to be able to hide against the judgment of God. It's coming, and even if God must get out the lamps or searchlights, he's going to find them, right? And so the Lord promised judgment against those who felt that God was distant or detached from their lives, and thus they just became complacent. Some people believe in God as a great clockmaker, right, who created the universe, wound it up, and left it ticking without any further intervention from him. Those who believe that there's no God, or if he... Um, or if he is, he has nothing to do with man, are terribly and tragically wrong. And so Edward Gibbon, in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, described the attitude towards religion in the last days of the Roman Empire, attitudes that's remarkably like our own today. All people regarded all religions as equally true. The philosophers regarded all religions as equally false. The politicians regarded all religions as equally useful man so verse 14 through 16 the intensity of judgment verse 14 the great day of the lord is near it is near and hastens quickly the noise of the day of the lord is bitter there the mighty men shall cry out that day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress a day of devastation and desolation a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness and a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. So the term day of the Lord is used more than 25 times in the Bible. It does not necessarily refer to one specific day. It speaks of God's time. The idea is that now uh, is the day of man, but the day of man is not going to last forever. One day the Messiah is going to end the day of man and bring forth the day of the Lord. And so it's a day of wrath because man will not give up without a fight and because mankind will receive the just penalty for his rebellion against the Lord. And Zephaniah is going to paint the picture powerfully with the repeated description, a day of. All right, verse 17 and 18, the certainty of judgment. Verse 17, I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. So God wants to make it plain and certain that he will judge a rebellious Judah. If they do not repent, there is no holding back from the completion of his judgment. And men trust in silver and gold, but it will do them no good on the day of God's judgment. And that is Zephaniah chapter 1. Thank you for joining me. All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Zephaniah chapter 2. Let's just jump right into the first two verses. Repent while there's still time. Verse 1. 
Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. So the, de the idea here is gathering together in a solemn demonstration of national mourning and repentance. And all the announcement of judgment in the previous chapter is understood as a warning and as an invitation to repentance. Um, the often unwritten theme behind almost every prophecy of judgment is this is what's going to happen if you do not repent. And so here the prophet pleads with the nation to repent before it's too late. And here the prophet calls for a sense of urgency in repentance. Each day passes like chaff. And there's nothing to show for the day if we neglect what's most important, getting right and staying right with God. <clears throat> all right, verse 3, the last chance. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that when you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So even the righteous must take heed to this warning. It would do them no good to say, The Lord speaks to my wicked neighbor and not to me. At a critical moment of national danger, even the righteous need to seek the Lord. And in more than one place, God promises to hide his righteous in the day of great judgment. It's fascinating. And uh, this is especially relevant to the time of the great tribulation, when Jesus warned us to watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It's Luke chapter 21, verse 36. So, let's come down to Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Judgment against the Philistines. Verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so sh there shall not be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures with shepherds for shepherds, for shelters for shepherds, and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. And the houses of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. So judgment's going to come against an unrepentant Judah, but it's also going to come against the pagan nations surrounding Judah. God promises to destroy the cities of the Philistines and give their land as pasture for the remnant of the house of Judah. The name Cherethites is a reference to the early geographical links with Crete. All right, verse 8 through 11, judgment against the Moabites and the Ammonites. Verse 8, I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual de desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats." against the people of the Lord of hosts, the Lord will be awesome to them. For he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. So God, first he's looking to the west and he sees, he sees the, uh, the Philistines. He looks to the east and he sees the Moabites and the Ammonites. So God promised to judge these people and bring them to perpetual desolation. And so the comparison of Moab and Ammon to Sodom and Gomorrah is not surprising in view of their origin. Moab and Ammon were the offspring of the incestuous relations with Lot's daughters with their drunk father after he fled the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God's going to glorify himself among the nations, and one way he would do this was to bring the idols of the nations low. All would see that their idols are vain and that the Lord alone is God. Verse 12 judgment against Ethiopia. You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. Right. So now God's looking to the south. He's going to judge the Ethiopians. Verse 13 through 15, judgment against Assyria. Verse 13, and he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation, as dry as the wilderness. The herd shall lie down in their midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge in the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold. For he will lay 
bear the seed of work. This is a rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there is none beside me. How she has come a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down. Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. So God's completing this circle of judgment against Israel's neighbors by looking at Assyria and the capital Nineveh. He was going to make a desolate city fit only for the habitation of animals and birds. Nineveh felt strong and confident, but God knew how to bring her low. Here, uh, the Lord fulfilled the principle of James chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so Zephaniah never really mentions why the nations are ripe for judgment. Perhaps he assumed we've already read Amos and Isaiah and Nahum, which describe the sins of those neighboring nations. All right, and that's chapter 2. Thank you for joining me. All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Zephaniah chapter 3, where the Lord rejoices over the restoration of his people. All right, let's take the first four verses, talking about Jerusalem, the wicked city. Verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted, to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So from the way that Zephaniah chapter 2 ended, we perhaps hoped that this oppressing city was Nineveh. From the references to her prophets, priests, and the sanctuary and the law, we learned that Jerusalem was the oppressing city. And so in repeating four phrases, she has not, she has not, and so forth, the prophet tells us the root of Jeremiah or um, Jerusalem's sin here. So she has not obeyed God's voice, right? God called to his people, but they did not listen, all right? She didn't receive correction. Correction certainly came, but she did not receive it as correction from the Lord. Instead, it was a bad time, tough circumstances, whatever, but she had not received correction. Right? She had not trusted in the Lord. God never gave her a reason to stop trusting in Him. He never proved Himself unfaithful or untrustworthy. Now, God's people are openly denying and contradicting God's word and promises, showing that they haven't trusted in the Lord. And she has not drawn near to her God. This is the worst offense was saved for last. God longed for relationship with His people, but they rejected His desire and went their own way. So she has not drawn near to her God. All right, verse 5 through 7, the righteous God. Verse 5, the Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails. But the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate. With none passing by, their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, Surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction, so that her dwelling would not be cut off, despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all her deeds. And so this made the unrighteous of his people even more criminal and tragic. God had been nothing but righteous to them, yet they responded with sin. Eventually, they're going to put themselves on the wrong side of God's righteousness and face his justice. And God had brought his justice to the nations around Judah, but it should have warned Judah that what would happen if they still rejected God. Instead of learning from the surrounding nations, they dedicated themselves to ungodliness all the more. Right? Verse 8 through 13, judgment and restoration. Verse 8, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord, to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds, in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord, 
the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness, and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. So, in light of the repeated and chronic sin of the nations and God's own people, God's going to bring judgment and then bring restoration. In this ultimate restoration, God would give the world a common language, a pure language, and the entire world is going to worship the Lord, not only Israel. And so my, most Bible scholars are going to see this as fulfilled in the days of the millennium, when Jesus reigns for a thousand years over this earth after his return in power and glory. So from this passage, many scholars believe that in that day, the world's going to go back to a common language, perhaps Hebrew. We don't know. And so literally, uh, to serve him with one accord can be rendered with one shoulder. The idea is that shoulders are working together as one to bear the load of the work. Uh, in the millennial earth, right, in the millennial reign, uh, Israel will be the world's superpower. But she's not going to be proud or haughty. Under the leadership of the Lord Jesus and his redeemed, she will know that her standing is of all grace. And so this is going to speak of the peace and prosperity Israel will know in the millennial earth, right? They're going to feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. All right, verse 14 through 20, restored with singing. Verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame. In every land where they were put to shame, at that time I will bring you back. Even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth, when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. So in light of the glorious promise of restoration, Israel should sing and shout with joy. God will save and redeem them from both their enemies and their iniquities. In this passage, the Lord God in your midst, oh mighty one, you know, the mighty ones will save. This passage gives us definite steps for consolation. We understand that God's in your midst, the Lord in your midst with the power to save. God takes joy in you. God gives you rest in his love and God sings over you. So we often underestimate the joy God has in his people and too often think God is just annoyed or irritated with us. And so we don't often think of God singing, but he does and he sings over his people. And this is just uh, how much joy and delight we give to the Lord that he breaks into a song. And so knowing, um, you know, that the tender love and care of God for us should make us respond in two ways. First, not to fear. If the Mighty One loves us and delights in us this way, what can we be afraid of? Second, uh, we let, you know, let not your hands be weak. Knowing this Mighty Lord of love is for us, we want to be for Him with all of our energy. and We will not become weak or weary in our service for Him. And so God promised to encourage the discouraged, to defeat our enemies, to heal the lame, and gather the scattered. All this is for his praise and fame and for ours, because we're found in him. Right? I'll give you fame and praise among all the peoples. Okay? And that is Zephaniah chapter 3. Thank you for joining me.